Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Aaron's High Cap Adventure Radio Program. We're here on the final 25 minutes, and I've got some special guests in here. I'm sure everybody knows these guys, but I'm going to give them a, a semi-formal introduction here. Billy Conway and Rick Smith are two friends who grew up hunting and fishing. They share their love of the outdoors with their fellow sportsmen with weekly blogs, newspaper articles, websites, seminars, and radio shows. And you can hear them on KNCT 91.3 FM every Wednesday and Friday for a five-minute update at 6.15 p.m. Every Friday afternoon from 5 to 6 p.m. on KTM right here, 1400 a.m. Every Saturday morning from 6 to 7 on KXRT. I'm sorry, KRXT, 98.5 FM, for their weekly Fins, Feathers, and Furs report. And if you live near Gonzales, catch them Saturday morning and noon at KCTI at 1450 AM. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Rick, did you write that? I didn't write that. I'm not <laughs> sure. It sounds pretty good. I want to meet these guys. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. That sounds impressive. Well, I, somehow or another, I got you guys on here, so it worked, and I appreciate you coming on. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. I'm a city boy. I came down here. I'll admit it. I'm a city boy. I know what I'm doing when it comes to tactical stuff, but when it comes to surviving and surviving on fish, I'm going to die. Okay? I'm just going to die. So I'm thinking to myself, who else better to talk to? All right? So I got you guys on here. I want to talk about survival fishing. Is there anything you... First of all, say hi to everybody. See what's going on. Anything new? Well, we appreciate it. Uh... We don't get a chance to come on uh, in the middle of the day very often. No, this is new for us. We're uh, usually not either half awake when we're on the show. But, uh, you know, you talk about survival fishing. We've got a couple of hundred uh, teams, over 400 fishermen, doing just that on Lake LBJ today. Bass Champs is having their tournament over there. And with the wind blowing like this, I'm glad they're there and I'm here in the studios with you, Matt. That's right. That's exactly right. (laughs) But, yes, we'd love to talk a little bit about survival fishing and uh, and survival boating. You know, there's a, there's a lot of things that we can discuss, that, uh, and it all comes down to pre-planning. Okay, well, let's, let's mix this all up to, within the contents of what I do here, and that's, that's being prepared. And okay. let's say somebody uh, has their bug-out bag. I want to I hit this really, really quick and first. You got a bug-out bag. Is there any fishing supplies that one could put in their bag that's compact, portable, so that if they had to go on the run, and there they are, they're out in the woods, by the river, by the pond, by the tank, or whatever, they can pull out their bug-out bag, some equipment that might be useful and helpful for a guy like me to survive? Oh, there's a lot of that uh, equipment, especially this time of year when the weather's cold. Uh, if you fall like if you fall in the lake, uh, you've only got a few minutes to get out of the lake. Hypothermia sets in pretty fast, and you're going to need some supplies to in your boat to help you survive to get back uh, back to the boat dock and get off the lake. Uh, the, probably the most important thing is to get out of the water quickly and have a change of clothes in your boat. Uh, if you got a change of clothes, uh, you can always uh, get dry and, and get warm if you got a, uh, something to wrap up in. If, uh, you know, and let someone know where you're going to be at on the lake. File a float plan, we call it. Let a friend know. And uh, don't go fishing by yourself in cold weather. Uh, that's, uh, you know, the summertime is a little different than the wintertime. You can survive a long time in the water. But in the wintertime, try to take a partner with you, someone that can help you if you if you do have a problem. Yeah, I was in the military. I was doing river crossings in, in cold weather. And I tell you, man, it, that's not a fun thing to do. But uh, let's go. let's go. For example, I'm in my car. We have a major catastrophe happen. I can't move my car anymore. I've got to grab my bug out bag, my two or three day bug out bag. I put it on my shoulder and I've got to start walking. And I'm, I'm going through the woods and I can't make it to my home or wherever I'm going. And I'm stuck. And I'm getting hungry. But I got what piece of equipment should I have in that bag to survive? Right. Well, besides all the standard things that you would have in a bug out bag anyway, it's very important to have a set of fishing hooks, and I would take quite a few. And there's a very compact. We're not talking about major gear at all here in, or any major weight. I'd take at least 50 fishing hooks with me. I'd have them packed ahead of time, and I'd have different sizes, everything from the small hooks for perch, bluegill, those kind of fish, on up to some larger hooks. Uh, also have some sinkers, a few lead sinkers with you, although you can make those in the in the wild if you have to. And then have you some 
a few hundred yards of line. And I would take braid is what I would recommend because it's more versatile to use for many other things besides just fishing. Uh, you could certainly take monofilament, but I'd recommend braid and a pretty heavy braid, something well, around. fishermen out there know what he's talking about, right? That's right. Okay. okay. But uh, those would be very, very important. Uh, you can always come across grubs and worms in the wild uh, for bait. Uh, that's pretty simple to do. Uh, maybe in some rocky terrain, you might have to turn over a few rocks to find things. But with those basic supplies, you can easily catch fish, and you can survive on fish what for is, a very what long What would be your method of casting out? Well, you don't really need to cast out. Uh, hopefully you've got a shoreline with some vegetation around it with some uh, some willows or some trees like that. You actually, casting out can take some chances of losing some hooks. Uh, I would uh, find a deeper spot, pay, possibly with some vegetation in the water, and then uh, tie the line to one of these trees. Use the tree as a pole. Let the line go down to however the depth is, and I would put, uh, I'd probably put 15 or 20 of these lines out around the shoreline where I'm going to make my base camp. That way, is depending. That what they mean by running out of trot line? Well, it would be similar to a trot line, but these would be individual lines. You could certainly do a trot line if you if you wanted to and get you a good flat stone and cast it out, and that does get you in some different depths. Also, uh, very important that uh, that you have plenty of hooks because you are going to lose some and you're going to break off some but it's important to find the spot where you feel that the fish are going to be that's that's where where do you hit that hammer on the piece of machinery that's the question here so here i am i'm hungry i got to do it fast and i've got my hooks like you just said and i come up to the stream okay stream i got to bend in the stream i got to straighten the stream what's the best place what's what's the trick of the trade to make sure I got fish on that hook. Well, it depends on the time of the year you're going to be out there. Like uh, this time of year, I would look for the the deeper water. Uh, you don't look for real shallow water because the fish are are uh, creatures of habit, just like we are. They like to stay comfortable, so they'll try to find the, the depth where the water is the warmest. Uh, in the summertime, if you're uh, if it's a stream, if there's running water in a shoal type uh, rapids type area, uh, put it below the rapids area because things wash down that river and creek that fish eat. They'll lay down there in that water past that uh, shoal or or rapids and collect crawfish, worms, whatever washes down the the river or the creek and that's how they get their food. They're like us too. They're kind of lazy. They'd rather have it come to them than them have to go hunt it. I I enjoy the hunt sometimes I'm doing the hog. (laughs) Fishing though, I don't have the patience for it, I guess. I've never gone fishing. Do you believe that? Well, we need to correct that. Now, that's something that we can do. We can take you out. And there is a reason it's called fishing and not catching, because there are times that you go out, and with the best of plans and the most expensive equipment, you are just going to fish. You're not going to catch. So. I, I must make a correction, though. I was taken out fishing one time. A very good friend of mine took me out fishing. He says, Matt, you got to try this. I'm out there. I'm like, this ain't working for me, man. <laughs> it's not working for me. But I know it's one of those skills that you've got to learn. It's like very important to know how to fish. Okay. Give me some other things that we can talk about that is important for somebody who's novice like me that they should know, um, can help them survive, um, how they can practice, where they can go, what you guys can do to, to help them maybe. Well, there's a lot of things that you can do, but certainly like any survival skills, you can read all you want to in the books and you can study about it. But you need to get out there and practice these skills. As you know, you need to get out and practice learning to start a fire. Um, It's great to read it in the book, watch the YouTube videos, and learn. But until you get out there and experiment and figure out how to do it in the environment, because it changes depending on where you might need those survival skills, what the environment you're in, Um, certainly get out and do some fishing and kind of learn about the habitats of the fish. And as Billy said, it depends totally on the time of year as to where you're going to find those fish because they want to be comfortable, they're cold-blooded, and they want to find plenty of oxygen in the water, and they want to find easy prey, something that they can eat on. And you never know because two guys can be fishing in the same boat. One can be using lure A, the other one lure B, and one's catching all the fish. So it depends a lot on not just technique, but what you've got on that line. And another thing, 
What are you going to do with the fish after you catch them? That's a good question. You know? <laughs> well, you're going to want to cook these fish. And you see uh, back in uh, on TV and in the, in the shows all the time, these guys rubbing these rocks together to try to start fires and things like that. The best thing to do in that bag you were talking about is put a small starter log in your bag. That way, if you're stranded, and make sure you got some matches or a lighter of some kind, mm-hmm. because then you've always got a source to make a fire and make heat. You can always find something to burn after you get the fire started. And uh, raw fish are not very good, no. so, so you're going to need to cook your fish. So what would um, cooking cooking the fish? What what are some tricks on that? Well, you can just put it actually. You can just put it on a stick and hold it over the fire, uh, and and let it let it cook. Because you're probably not going to have pots and pans if you're in a survival mode, so, unless, unless it's in your bug out. Or you can, or right, or you can, or you can put a rock on the fire and lay the fish on the rock and let let it fry on you, the rock. You know, this is really weird because I'm about to give a class later today, and I know what I'm doing. Okay, I know it inside and out, top to bottom, the whole works. And now we're talking about fishing. I feel like such a novice. I'm kind of feeling like what a, a student who's going to learn how to shoot a gun feels when it comes to fishing. I'm really I'm terrible at this. So I'm going to start. I wanted to ask you, though. you going to say something? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say one of the things that in any survival mode is having enough liquid, enough water. And it is safe to eat the eyes of a fish. And it's safe to drink the water from the bodily fluids of most fish and that's something most people don't realize especially if you're in a saltwater environment a lot of mariners have been able to survive on just eating the eyes i know that sounds terrible but when you're thirsty there's nothing better and so that is fresh water in those in those membranes and in those that's interesting so it's just something else to take into consideration we all know that there's two kinds of water there's the kind that you is potable that you can drink and then there's a kind in the wild that you're not sure about if it's been standing for a while. So if you don't have a the proper straw or drinking bottle with you, then remember that all parts of that fish, those are edible parts, and there's a lot of moisture in there. Do you have on the top of your head a book, a manual, something that somebody can say, is this, you have to go out and experience it for yourself, obviously, but this is a, a checklist of things that a person could get and say, I'm not a fisherman, but I know how important it is to be able to fish. Uh, I'm not going to have the opportunity to go train, 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 but i got to have a crash course in it somehow. Is there anything like that that covers all the bases that you're happy with? Well, are you talking about learning to fish, or are you are talking about uh, survival fishing survival, techniques? Survival mode. Yes, there are some uh, books out there that uh, have some great information in them, especially as related to saltwater, because it seems like there's a lot more of those incidents where people have to survive for a long period of time on their wits and their survival techniques, their ability to to survive, much more so than in freshwater. I don't have a name of them right offhand, but if you Google, there are several great books out. I know there's one that's about the Native American experience that was written about survival techniques that Native Americans have done, and it's got about uh, 50 different techniques, and uh, out of those, about 20 of them are all about fishing. Wow, that's pretty interesting. You, you guys, you made a comment about different types of fishing hooks. I can understand the different sizes, but is there different types of hooks for different purposes? There, there is different types of hooks for different pers- uh, purposes. Uh, you know, there's there's actually snare hooks that you can use if you can see the fish. Put a, a line on the end of a pole, and you could actually snare the fish. A treble hook with that's three hooks that that uh, are on the same uh, uh, platform, I guess, and you would just put it down there and try to snare the fish. Uh, there's uh, the round hooks that uh, a lot of people use for catfishing. Uh, there's, uh, there's uh, of course, different sizes. But, yeah, there is different hooks for different applications. But uh, I, would, uh, I would definitely have some snare hooks in the bag just in case you, you, you can see what you're trying to catch and you can actually snare it. I do have to make one comment. That is illegal, by the way, but in a survival technique, you're not worried about that. You're Thank worried you about that. Yes, I just had to put that disclaimer for the game wardens that are out there listening. But is that also true for rough fish? 
Not true for rough fish. Okay, you got me there. So that well, why don't we that is a good one, especially me. What you're talking well, about? Well, there's two types of fish. Basically, there's game fish that are controlled by the uh, okay. state parks and wildlife as far as bag limits and length limits and this kind of thing. And then there's rough fish. Uh, a lot of the rough fish do not have any limits, and you can catch them any way that's legal. One other thing that's a good thing if you end up uh, uh, with that. Uh, out in the wilds and you don't have the ability for got to take any hooks or anything the go back to the old way of gigging you can make a good gig stick out of a out of a limb by spreading it apart making about four different pointed areas on it and uh, gigging you can gig for frogs you can gig for fish but don't just try a single stick with a single point on it you need to create your own gig and pretty easy to do Especially if you happen to have a good knife with you, and if not, then find you some good flint rock. I wanted rock. to ask you that. I forget the movie of it with Tom Hanks. There's a scene in there where he's surviving on the island, and he gets the spear and he spears the fish after a while. Is there a trick on direction, angle, uh, behind the fish, in front of the fish, side of the fish, so that you don't spook them when you're trying to spear them? Wherever you can put the stick in it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on, on the rough fish and the game fish, the example of the rough fish are, are carp, the carp family, the buffalo, and, and that type of fish. Uh, your bass, uh, white bass, bluegill, catfish, all those are, are considered game fish, and it's not legal to snare them. But, uh, you know, sometimes you have to survive. Talk about the trout line. Explain it. Well, this is a series of hooks, usually up to 25 hooks on a line, uh, quite often attached to a limb or something, a stick on the shore, and then a weight on the other end. And ever so many feet, you'll have a hook attached to it. Each of those hooks is baited. Uh, with something like shad or chicken livers or whatever that you might be able to have with you. And uh, you take that uh, loose end, the bitter end of it, uh, throw that rock out as far as you can. And so then you're fishing at different depths. You're fishing everything from up by the shores, which would typically be shallow water, on out to deep water. And then when you see that limb moving, uh, then you've got a fish on there, a good chance of catching more than one on that because you've got up to 25 hooks. Of course, in survival, you'd have as many as you wanted, I guess. Okay. Uh, of course, when you're talking about survival, too, uh, you're talking about fish, but don't limit it to fish. There's crayfish in the water. There's mussel in the water. There's clams in the water. All these are edible. Ask the people from New or- from uh, Louisiana. <laughs> You know, crayfish are popular over there. It's a, it's a delicacy. And so these are all in the water, too, and it's easy to catch them. Uh, cra- a crayfish, all you do is go along the shallow water, turn the rocks over, and, and just look for them. I, I'm actually quite embarrassed with myself because I, I'm one who um, practices being prepared in all different aspects as much as I can. Fishing, though, is one of those things with me. I'm like, I'm over here. I don't want to deal with it. I'm just not into it. Big mistake. There's so much, just based on what you're telling me, water, all the different types of food besides fish that you can eat. It's a plethora of nutrients and energy and food for you in the water if you just know what you're doing. That's exactly right. It's an easy way to acquire the protein that you need to survive. And, uh, you know, hunting wild game, especially if you do not have the skills or the or a gun or something, can be difficult. There are ways to trap it, but you can expend a lot of energy. Fishing, you do not typically expend that much energy. And there's so many different kinds of proteins that you can get from the fishing environment. Mm-hmm. And. And don't just think about if you're if if you're in a situation like this. Don't just think about what's in the water, because you've got trees that got have nuts. You've got uh, vines that have berries. Uh, a lot of these things are edible also, and they grow uh, in abundance along rivers and streams. Okay, great info. There's there's this. Uh, I'm, I'm not even sure what the device is called. It's a wheel. You set it up. You throw the line out, and it bobs like this. What do we call that? Help me on that. Is that any good to have in your backpack? That certainly would help. It is a little automatic reel that uh, is very light to carry with you, and uh, when the fish strikes, it automatically sets the hook for you. That, that sounds like a fishing rod for yeah. dummies. Yeah, that's you know? uh, that's referred to as a, it's a yo-yo. It's a, what it's what it's called, and in Texas, that's also illegal. Oh wow! Right. But, so, so, okay. <laughs> so, but again, you're in a survival mode. It's like brass knuckles. You can yeah. buy as many as you want. Don't wear them. Uh, this bobby, this yo-yo, you can buy as many as you want, but you can't use it. 
All right. What were you going to say? It's just, it's not illegal to own one. It's just illegal to use it. And I guess when it, stuff hits the fan, who really cares, right? You, you're in survival mode. Okay. What else can you tell me here? We were talking about uh, on the ground. What about on the water? You were talking about boats, things on the boats. Is there anything else that we need to know about when it comes to fishing and um, surviving on the water? Let's, let's say we don't have a, a huge uh, fishing boat. We just got a basic, what, John boat? Is that what you call it? And you've got something portable you can carry out there. What can, what can you tell me about that? Well, you need to always plan ahead. And Billy uh, alluded to it earlier in the show about following a float plan. And this is a simple, uh, just let your family know where you're going to be, what ramp you're putting in, what river you're going to be on, where you're going to be. And then hopefully you have a cell phone with a fully charged battery with you in a waterproof bag of some type so that you can call them if the fish are really biting and you want to stay out for a longer period of time. Let them know so that they're not worried about you. Uh, do take uh, some waterproof matches. Uh, think about the fact, uh, planning ahead, that you may be out there for 48 or 72 hours. You could easily uh, fall out of the boat. Uh, there would be other things that could happen. That's one of the reasons to always go with a friend. So you plan ahead for these things. You have, a, we call them ditty bags in in boating, where it's just a bag with some essentials, some power bars, some extra bottles of water, and this kind of thing. But you've got to remember that if you happen to fall out of that boat and it floats away from you, then you are in trouble because that ditty bag is probably still in the boat. We always wear our life jackets this time of year. It's recommended that you wear your personal flotation device year-round, but it's especially important this time of year. Take a change of clothes, have a flashlight with you, have something to start a fire. Mm -hmm. And, Rick, you also mentioned that the boat could float away from you, and it's very important if you're not wearing a life jacket uh, your boat's floating away. Don't try to swim to get the boat because you're going to lose that battle most of the time. Fatigue's going to set in, then you're going to be in trouble. If the boat floats away, go to shore. Let the boat go. Also, How far out would that be? It depends on the person and how good a swimmer you are. Okay, so it's either the shore or the boat, depending which way you're going to drown first. Is that what you're saying? It's an emergency. You have to make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> it's always best to try to stick with the boat if you can and to get out of the water as quickly as you can. Your body heat is dissipated much more rapidly when you're in the water. So even though it may be cold out, getting out of the water, sitting on the bow of the boat, even though it may be upside down, uh, try to dry out as much as you can, uh, get your clothes as dry as you can. But it's a lot easier uh, to see a boat from the air if a helicopter's out looking for you than it is to see just a person with their head bobbing in the water. Gotcha. Okay, in uh, normal conditions, licensing to go fishing, what's the deal on that? It is required to carry a fishing license with you. You can get those at all the big box stores and any of the Parks and Wildlife Departments. You can also get them online. Uh, licenses are very in price. The, we recommend the Jumbo. That way you get the hunting and fishing license with the saltwater and freshwater stamps, all part of it. Uh, that's the best way to go. That money does help Parks and Wildlife. It helps our natural resources here in Texas. But if you want just a fishing license, you can get just a fishing license. I believe they're around $25 for a uh, resident Texan. So that allows you to fish anything you want. That's right. You do have to get the saltwater and freshwater endorsements, though. Okay. It allows you to fish any public waters. If you, uh, if you want to fish on someone's property, if the river flows through someone's property, you want to fish that river, you do need to get permission from that landowner. Okay. That's a good point. Yeah, I think that would be, especially if the landowner doesn't like it. Okay, well, guys, look, time's ticking away here. Uh, I'm going to have to close it up in just a minute. You guys want to finish up with anything? Tell us about what's going on, anything, upcoming events. A lot of bass tournaments going on. Uh, like I said, we've got one on LBJ today. Uh, we just remind everyone, remember your safety rules. Think about the fact that uh, how you're going to get back in that boat. If you do happen to fall out, have a plan ahead of time, and hopefully you have a ladder. But if you don't, have a buddy with you to help you get back in. And just plan ahead, be safe, and uh, enjoy it because our lakes are full. It's the first time in seven years that we've had this much water. Fishing is fabulous, and it's going to be a great spring and summer. Thanks for having us on, Matt. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. Thanks for coming. I'll tell you what, just this little conversation has sparked my juices flowing as to, like, I mean, i got to get with this thing, you know? I know a lot of people do it. A lot of people love to fish. I just never got in the groove. I just need to see if I can catch the bug and, uh, and get going with it.